All right, so maybe we talk a little bit about uh, Ian Thomas. When did you, how did you hook up with him and when did that happen? Um, I was in the band The Looking Glass, which had, which had come from St. Catharines and come out of being the British Mod Beats. And uh, we had, uh, when our manager died, this is just a quick synopsis of them, we went down from a six piece to a four piece and our drummer was from Hamilton. And we, bound, we wound up sort of moving the center of the band away from St. Catharines to Hamilton. And I'd been playing with that band as a four piece. Uh, and that band broke up in the spring of 1970 um, when the drummer, Dave Papernick, uh, I think he joined the uh, Jameson Roberts Blues Band in Hamilton. Was Stu Fargo still with you guys then? Or? Yep. Stu Fargo, Dave Van Dusen, and myself, and Dave Papernick. That was the four-piece. No joke alone. I guess Joe... Yeah, how did no, that work? Joe had left. Joe was, Joe was playing bass and uh, in the band, and when he left, I took over playing bass. I was playing guitar at that, at that time, had been playing guitar. Um, after my beginnings on bass, I then went sort of back and forth in different bands, playing guitar and playing bass. Um, and uh, the, the, that band went down to four-piece. I went to bass. Joe bought that Gibson bass from me. Um, and, uh, uh, I was playing the Fender bass and we were playing in Hamilton and then that band ended when Dave left to go to Jameson Roberts and we didn't have a manager anymore and we were sort of rudderless band. We were just sort of drifting around playing clubs. So I knew the band was ending and I was with my friend Swen, who was this, uh, another bass player, a good friend of mine from Grimsby, from Beamsville. And, uh, we were at my apartment in Hamilton. And we're standing in the elevator. I always think about these, these, these points in time that were the crux of, of your whole future, right? I'm standing at the elevator and outside my apartment and I can hear the phone ringing. Of course, we didn't have answering machines. Uh, I'm surprised we had phones back then. And the phone's ringing inside my apartment. And Swen says, maybe you should go and answer that. And I said, oh, whatever, no, let's go, you know, wherever we're going. And he says, you never know who's calling you. It could be your big break, lucky break, like laughing. So I said, we're waiting, the elevator's not coming. And of course the phone would ring 50 times in those days, right? So I went back, opened my door, went and answered the phone. And it was a guy called John Harris, uh, who was managing uh, Tranquility Base, a band called Tranquility Base in those days. He now has the Harris Institute in Toronto. Um, and he says, hi, my name's John Harris, blah, blah, blah. Would you be interested in auditioning for Tranquility Base? And I didn't know anything about Tranquility Base. I'd never, I'd heard the name, but I thought they were a horn band or something. Uh, it, being in Hamilton, that's a, there were a lot of sort of soul bands and so on. And I said, uh, I'm thinking I'm out of work, okay. And uh, I said, okay, and for some reason I went, uh, oh, okay, well, you're, you're auditioning bass players? He says, yeah, we got a couple of guys coming tomorrow, Gene Laska and, uh, and somebody else, Bobby Hebert. And, um, and I just was like, Gene Laska was like my idol in Hamilton. He was like the best bass player in Hamilton. And I was like, Gene La well, why would I go? Like Gene Laska will just walk in there and ace the gig, right? So, but my friend said, no, you gotta go. You gotta go and check it out. So I went to some outdoor gig that they were doing. So after they had played their set, I, I heard them and I was like, oh, there's two girls in the band and they're doing like pop vocal stuff and they're quite good. And the guy, the main guy there has got a pretty good voice, Ian Thomas, right? And I'd never really heard of him before. So I went up after and I started talking to them and uh, started talking to Ian. And I suddenly decided I really want to be in this band because I'd been in vocal bands pretty well my whole life up till then, right? And like these guys had six part vocals with two girls who sang great and Ian Thomas being a great singer and everybody sang. And the, and the drummer was a drummer from a band called Magic Circus. Uh, Roz Parks, who I'd always wanted to play with. Um, so I was like, I really want to be in this band. So I started talking to Ian and telling him all this stuff about myself. And he, he sort of kidded after me. He's like, wow, you really kind of came on strong there. Um, and I said, oh yeah, I write songs. And uh, he says, do you sing? I said, yeah, I sing. So I got the gig probably because Gene Laska didn't sing. <laughs> and uh, so I, I met Ian that day and then we... Um, he said, well, we're playing at Granny's, which was a club in the, in the basement of Union Station in Toronto in the 60s. And everything was purple. And it's when, it's when clubs were purple and there was no TVs in, the, in there. Uh, and uh, it's because everybody was doing drugs, you didn't need TVs. I think that's 
what it was. And the color purple just... <laughs> and the color purple just because it was the 60s and you could paint a room purple. So I went there and I started rehearsing with them after their gig uh, and just stayed. And, uh, um, and I, think, uh, I think Bob Hebert was playing bass with them. He had, he had agreed to do a couple of months and Bob Deutsch had been their bass player before. So uh, um, I started rehearsing with them and then started playing about a week or so later and was in the band, so. Yeah. I stayed in the band, Ian left to, uh, he, was a, he got a job as a producer at CBC and uh, he left the band about uh, a year and a half later um, and the band continued and the band continued through, I don't know, it felt like the, it, it just all sorts of players went through that band. It was one of those bands where they kept the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the franchise going. And, and uh, Tranquility Bass had had a, a big hit in 1967, a Canadian hit called If You're Looking, and then they had another one called In the Rain or something. And they had sort of traveled on that strength for a long time. So then I stayed in the band, uh, and I left the band, and I went and did some other stuff, then I came back into the band again. I had been playing, uh, I played bass in that band, then I came back and played guitar for a while. Uh, and then Ian, uh, I recorded with Ian when he did his first record. We, we, um, we recorded in Toronto and uh, um, he did that record. And then in, we went to England to do his second album and I was still playing in Tranquility and doing some other stuff. And we did the second album in, in England. And then when he came back, which would be in 19, uh, I think 74, 73 or 74, 1974, he, put the, he decided to put a band together and go on the road. He'd had a big hit with Painted Ladies and uh, it was like, we need to go out and tour. So at that point, I came with him and brought the drummer from, who was currently in Tranquility Bass, Mike Orberly, uh, with me uh, uh, to Ian's band. And he had another band called Shiloh in Toronto that he took half the band from. So those two, we, he brought uh, Darcy Wickham and Josh Anderson and uh, Hugh Syme. Uh, in, so that was our band. And we headed out on, on the road. And Hugh played keyboards. Hugh was playing keyboards, yeah. So I heard somebody told me that you actually wrote that beginning lick part to Painted Ladies. But you weren't with them at that point? or? Uh, well, just the bass line... Oh, you did is my bass line uh which uh th there's a little bit of weird synchronicity with that because um uh, uh when i was in tr when i was in um, looking glass Stu fargo had a song called happiness is which had been written about his brother who committed suicide and in st catherine's and um blair was his brother's name and uh he had the song called Happiness Is that we used to do, and it was sort of this same sort of groove. And I had played that bass line in that song. It seemed like the right thing. When I heard Painted Ladies, when we were sitting in Ian's uh, living room and he was playing me that song, and we were trying to figure out sort of what he would do with it, I thought, oh, you know what? This is the same kind of groove. It would be great if I played that bass line. And I played the bass line. He's like, oh, that's great. That's, that moves it along, and it's the right thing. And, uh, the synchronicity part is um, many years later, 20, 30 years later, Ian wrote a couple of books and uh, in the opening dedication to one of his books, it says dedicated to Stu Fargo. And I went, what? How do you know Stu Fargo? Like, that seemed ridiculous. And uh, um, asked Ian about it. Or I know, no, I asked Stu about it. Uh, when we did the looking glass thing there, they were, they were talking, right? Um, the reunion, and he said that he had done commercials, done done singing uh, 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 for for uh, jingles. Ian had done jingles, and and Stu was a copywriter, and was involved with the ad company, and they'd got to know each other and become best friends. And uh, it was like, uh, I have no idea whether the whether Stu ever went. Do you know Steve Hogg, or you know they ever associated? Because I don't think he knew Stu played had played music at that time. Um, so uh, anyway, it was a bizarre coincidence. So I wound up using uh, the, the bass line from Stu's song, Ian, Ian's song, Painted Ladies. And, uh, Does Stu know this today or no? Yeah, we, we, we had that discussion. So uh, um, so how it, much did it cost? <laughs> <laughs> no, it didn't, it didn't cost anything, I don't think. But uh, it, was, uh, it was just a weird coincidence. So Synchronicity. Synchronicity. We'll figure. 
Thank you.